remember had been to uh, the basilica there where they also met Father John when he was there. And they sent me a photo um, certifying that they really were there at Moro's Basilica. So I have had the privilege of visiting um, the shrine, but not when Father John was there. He has made a tremendous improvement in, in the project, and it's, a, it, it's one of our next only two Brother Andres um, um, shrine in Montreal, uh, where St. Joseph's Oratory is located. Um, next, we are focusing on Father Moro. You know, Father Moro was um, beatified, and we are looking forward to a day when he will be canonized. Well, more uh, Father John will tell us all the details. So we just want to um, thank you for your uh, presence here this evening. Um, we will, of course, pray for our community uh, that has been blessed with Holy Cross presence, and we pray for all the community served by the Congregation of Holy Cross, both brothers and priests, and also the sisters. And now we will get to know really who Father Moro is, although we have referred to Father Moro several times, you may not have focused on him. But now we have the label name fixed on near his statue, so you cannot miss him. It used to be the time when people are asking, who is this guy, who is that guy? So now we have names for them. Okay? So just know that. Plus, in the altar, I don't know if you ever came to the sanctuary to see the altar, we have placed the relics of both Brother Andre, that side, and Brother, I mean, Father Moreau, this side. So it's, it's transparent. You can see through to see the relic and what's written there. So if you are curious, if you want to pray, particularly have a devotion to both Brother Andre and Father Moro, you are most welcome to come to the sanctuary. Just stay uh, near the altar, you will see that. So those are some things I just wanted to tell you. Um, so today, I'm very happy uh, to have Father John um, Teresa with us. Um, in Holy Cross, we depend on one of the main characteristics of Father Moro's spirituality is uh, trust in divine providence. Divine providence is a huge thing um, in our spirituality. We all depend on divine providence every day of our lives. This, this parish is a result of divine providence. What we do here is all divine providence. Like Father John was feeling bad, he, he's never had a chance to uh, see the launch. And the launch was supposed to be happening today, middle of his talk at 7.30. So, yeah, what do I do now? I can't, can we change the, the timing? No. Um, I told him, you can even talk to us for half an hour and then go out and see the launch and come back and talk to us. <laughs> but, but providence works, you know. Um, the launch that was supposed to take today, uh, take place today, is uh, postponed to tomorrow, which will give him ample time to really stay. Luckily, he's staying back for a few more days, so he has the chance to see the launch tomorrow. So, there you go. Divine Providence works in wonderful ways. So, without uh, further ado, I um, call upon Father John to speak to us. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Father John. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure, joy to be with you all. I so enjoyed Masses yesterday. I'm just in awe of this community, um, seeing just the participation of everyone from like welcoming people to, gosh, the music ministry, the readers, the Eucharistic ministers. Anyway, it's really impressive. So praise God that you have such a wonderful, wonderful community here. 
and uh, such a beautiful church. Um, I think I get the feeling there's there are people here are from a lot of places like in the north, northeast, midwest. Anyway, I'm from Long Island originally. I bet there aren't many Long Islanders down here. Just kidding, I bet there are a lot. I'm from Cold Spring Harbor. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Cold Spring Harbor is where I'm from. So anyway, and uh, I went, I, you know, people, how, people ask, how did you get to know Holy Cross? I went to Notre Dame and graduated in 1983 and entered the community shortly thereafter. I was ordained a priest. I professed final vows, perpetual vows, we say at Holy Cross, September 1st, 2001, and was ordained a priest April of 2002. So um, my assignments have been in, um, thank you, Father John. My assignments have been in um, Arizona, uh, in Phoenix, which was wonderful, and ministering to a Spanish-speaking population there, and then pastor of St. Joseph Parish in South Bend, and then um, doing the ministry in, in France, as Father John mentioned. And yeah, so it was great seeing Amber and her mom again. So. Um, so yeah, I thought, well, you know, we'll talk a little bit about Basil Moreau, right, tonight, and uh, maybe fill in some of the gaps for you. And I'll keep an eye on the time, and we'll make sure we have some time for some questions at the end, if that would be interesting for you. So I'm going to be telling the gentleman in the back just to, like, advance slides. I'm just going to do it that way. So since it's nighttime and we can't see your beautiful window, um, I went ahead and put an image of it up. And so here we have in the top left corner, that's Father Moreau, and uh, let's start with him, give you a little background. And I'm actually going to get to the man on the, on the right, too, eventually, so, because um, I think it'd be interesting for you to hear a little bit about him. You might not even know who he is, so I'll talk about him in a few minutes. Okay, next. Okay, so the story of Father Moreau begins in La Belle France and beautiful France, right? And um, next, please. And in particular, this region of France. This is what we, like maybe the Northwest region of France. If I had my laser pointer here, I would point to, you know, you see, you'll see Paris is that big, big city. You can tell there's a lot of roads that go there, right? But Le Mans is the city down to the left, near the center of the screen. So that's, Le Mans is where this story really takes place, okay? And uh, so this is a, the region of France called Pays de la Loire, right? The, like, Loire country region, okay? Next, please. Okay, so Father Moreau is from a small village outside of the larger town, larger city of Le Mans. His village is called Lenier en belin all right? And it's a little village, probably about, you know, eight miles outside of Le Mans. And he uh, is like the ninth of 14 children. And um, his family is um, not poor, but certainly not well off. They're getting by all right, okay? Now he's born February 11th, 1799, okay? And now this building, which is depicted here, is, you know, in, in one of our textbooks, it says, you know, this is the house where he was born, right? And, you know, I've been to this place, right, in this village of lenier en belin That structure still exists, that house. Um, and uh, the lady who lives there now, she comes out and she, she knows me now, but she would come out and she'd say, no, nope, that's not true. It's not true. This is not the house where he was born. What we, what we figured out is basically, you know, this house has been really redone a lot, right? I mean, 1799 to 2021, right? So imagine a structure a lot more humble looking than that, okay? Maybe there's some kind of internal framework that's still there. But, and if you go to the next slide, please. Also on the property of where Father Moreau was born, was raised. There's this building, okay? Now, what did they do for a living? Okay, so Father Moreau's parents were named Louis Moreau, and his mother was Louise, okay? And so, you know, 
they cultivated a little, a little piece of property. They had a couple animals, apparently, maybe a cow, maybe some goats, right? Um, but Louis Moreau, Basil's father, uh, was a wine merchant. So he would uh, go about surrounding villages and into Le Mans, and he'd be selling wine, okay? I know what you're all thinking, you're thinking typical French, right? Um, so that's what he was kind of doing for a living. This, in this building, supposedly this is where uh, Louis Moreau would keep his, the wine, um, do you call them casks? I don't know if that sounds familiar to me. But anyway, that's where they would keep it. Now, what's interesting is on the upper level, the boys would sleep in here. The girls would sleep in the house you saw in the previous slide, okay? So, 9th and 14 children in this um, little village called Lenye en Belin. Now, it's interesting, you know, to talk about the village he's from is important because he learned s there were certain influences on his life, okay? Um, people worked together in the village um, to, to, I guess, survive is a little dramatic, but like, to make their way, you know. Um, people would kind of work together. And Father Moreau learned from his mother a devotion to Our Lady and also to the cross of Christ. And we know this from the testimony of Father Moreau's nephew, okay? So that little, like, he learned from his mother a devotion to the cross of Christ is very interesting and also a very strong devotion to Our Lady, okay? And these are aspects of Father, become important aspects of Father Moreau's spirituality, his life as a priest, and he passes them on to us, right? Also from his parents, he learned the stories of the persecuted church. Now maybe if we go to the next slide, I'm trying to remember which one I had. Okay, so this is uh, Father Moreau's hometown parish church, okay? And this is like, it's really pretty in France. Uh, you know, we have actually a French woman here. She can tell you this better than I. But at the entry to every village in France, it's beautiful. There's something called a calvaire, a calvary. And it's like a stone or with, with like a crucifix or a cross, right? Typically a crucifix. So this is the calvaire or the calvary. Uh, at the entrance to Lenier en Belin. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so, you know, we're gonna talk French Revolution a little bit to give us some background here, right? So, everyone thinks, when people hear the French Revolution, 1789, so I'm gonna go back a little before Father Moreau's birth in 1799, sort of set the context here. 1789, we always think storming of the Bastille, right? And like, this was this great, you know, uh, the people rising up against the monarchy, right? So we have a lot of romantic images of the French Revolution. Now, but the French Revolution, as you recall, um, it turned pretty bad. It turned very violent, uh, especially during the Reign of Terror. So don't hold me to all my dates. I mean, you can clarify my dates, madame, but it's like, I think it's 1792, 93, 1793, this reign of terror happens, right? And the reign of terror really targeted the church, okay? Because it was, you know, thought that the church was kind of very tight with the monarchy, okay? And if you want to do away with the monarchy, well, you know, how do you keep the church around, right? So it turned really ugly. Next slide, please. Um, this was actually before the Reign of Terror began. Church property was confiscated, okay? Um, I think something like 10% of France, French land, was owned by the church, okay? So church properties were confiscated. Um, and then next slide, please. And then the Reign of Terror really sets in with the guillotines, and guillotines were set up in, this is the one in Paris, but in most cities, in France, including in Le Mans, there was a guillotine. So we're talking late 19th century, right? Okay, so uh, there was an option to have a kind of clearer image of the guillotine, a little zoom in. I decided not to go with that. All right, next slide, please. 
Okay, so, um, but back to, let me just go back to Father Moreau's village, right? So he's growing up in this village and he's raised on the stories of the church that's persecuted. His hometown pastor died in a, a prison in Le Mans, okay? Because he was a priest who wouldn't swear an oath of loyalty to the revolutionary government. Um, now, Father Moreau never knew that hometown priest. Father Moreau was born several years after, okay? But he's raised on the stories in his hometown village. The associate pastor, the vicar of his hometown parish, is exiled to Spain. And, and the stories of the persecution of the church, um, you know, or the Catholics are telling these stories to their children. So he's hearing about how the church was so persecuted, but that some priests remained faithful to Rome, right? And did not sign an oath of loyalty to the revolutionary or constitutional government, okay? And Father Moreau was baptized, 1799, by one of those priests who had remained, like, faithful to Rome, okay? This is also a kind of major influence in Father Moreau, you know, as he grows up and becomes Father Moreau. He, it's sort of like an influence on his own spirituality and uh, his... Um, yeah, his uh, being very attached to the Church of Rome, okay? Um, so, thank you. Yeah, that was, that was helpful. Okay, so when Father Moreau was a little boy, his hometown parish priest sees that he's got some uh, skills and some aspects of his personality that would make him a good priest. Now, by the time Father Moreau was a little boy, the, the, uh, Napoleon had made peace with the Catholic Church, and so the faith was now able to be practiced again, okay? So uh, he's a little boy. The pastor of his hometown parish is starting a school um, to educate the children in the faith. Because something I neglected to mention is, you know, when the French Revolution happened, I mean, education in France had been primarily run by the church, right? So now that, you know, church property is confiscated and, you know, religious orders aren't even allowed to exist, right? Then the educational system is just decimated, right? And most of all, you've got all these people who are growing up with no knowledge of the faith. So Father Moreau's hometown pastor, this is now after the reign of terror has ended, peace with the church now, we're talking now early 19th century, he starts a school in the rectory. A woman in the town starts a school for girls. Father Moreau kind of is part of that little school. His hometown pastor is thinking this kid could be a priest one day. Talks to Father Moreau's parents. Remember their names? Louis and Louise, right? I just think those are great. You know, we just think, of course it's Louis and Louise. Louis and Louise, and they say, yes, he can be enrolled in the school. And then they say yes to the priest, like, yes, he can go to the seminary, right? Um, and uh, so he leaves for the seminary at like the age of 14, okay? It's like a junior seminary. So we're talking early 19th century. There's a junior seminary about 60 miles away. Louis Moreau brings young Basil to this junior seminary. Then around the age of 16, the young Basil Moreau comes here, which is the major seminary in the city of Le Mans, okay? Um, so that's kind of the, the, I think the story of his childhood, being raised in this village, being very uh, raised in the, strongly in the Catholic faith by his parents, um, in a big family. Family is hugely important for him. And then, um, uh, you know, being baptized by a priest who didn't sign that oath of loyalty to the constitutional government. All these things are very influential on him. Now he gets to the seminary, and between the ages of like 16 and 22, he's studying to be a priest. 
Next, please. That's the building today, actually. So it's, what's kind of neat is that these buildings, you know, I took that photo, it's kind of neat. The seminary from the early 19th century, it's a public school now. It's no longer a seminary. Okay. Still there. It's kind of neat to see. Next, please. So Father Moreau was ordained a priest there uh, in 1821. Uh, this is called the Chapel of the Visitation. It's in Le Mans. And um, this uh, beautiful chapel, and you can, if you go to the next frame, I think you can see what it looks like even today, right? So um, this is where he was ordained a priest, 1821. Ordained a very young man. Okay, next. Okay, so Father Moreau's ordained a priest for the Diocese of Le Mans, and his bishop sees that he's got some some uh, gifts that would make him a good formator of seminarians, okay, uh, of future priests. So the bishop says, Basil Moreau, I want you to be formed to be a formator of future priests, of seminarians. So I'm going to send you to Paris where you're going to study with the Sulpicians, okay? So as a priest, he's sent to Paris, and then he spends some time at this place, which is just outside of Paris, and it's called the Solitude, okay? It's like a Sulpician novitiate. And this is extremely important in, in Father Moreau's formation, his development, because this is the place where he discovers a love of solitude, okay? And so, um, that place too, you can, you can visit today, and it's now sort of within Paris itself, because Paris has grown a lot. So, all right, so next slide, please. So, having done that formation with the Lepetians, Father Moreau goes back to Le Mans, and now goes back to that seminary where he had done his own seminary formation, and becomes a professor. He becomes a professor of scripture, uh, of dogma, okay? Um, he was a professor of philosophy for a while, okay? So that becomes his, um, his work as he's forming these uh, young priests. All right, next slide, please. All right now, while he's at that seminary, Father Moreau uh, realizes that the future hope of the church and of the faith in France depends on re-educating the French countryside in the faith. Because he's, you know, this is like, you know, 25 years after the reign of terror, and still there's not a lot of, the schools haven't really flourished once again. He wants to be part of that effort to help reestablish the educational system, but especially like faith, Christian faith. So, um, because he believes that education is a work of resurrection. He believes that education of youth, Christian education and Christian formation prepares the world for better times than our own. Okay, these are phrases from his writings. So he, at that seminary, as a priest formator, assembles around himself a group of young men whom he calls the auxiliary priests. These are young priests, seminarians also becoming priests, and their role is to go out to the French countryside and help country pastors and also kind of help to revitalize the faith in the countryside around Le Mans, okay? So those are called the auxiliary priests. Um, now, back to this window. Previous slide, please. So now we're going to talk about something about the man in the top right-hand corner. Okay? All right. Now, next slide. His name is Jacques Dujarrier. Now, Father Jacques Dujarrier is in your window here, okay? He was a, also a priest of the Diocese of Le Mans, but he preceded 
of Father Moreau, he was about 30, 35 years older than Father Moreau. This priest, Father Dujarier, suffered a lot during the Reign of Terror. He was ordained a priest shortly before the Reign of Terror, and he was like working as a priest in secret during the Reign of Terror. He could have been arrested, imprisoned, maybe executed. Um, so he was kind of working as a priest uh, secretly and, and celebrating the sacraments for people in secret, okay? And after the Reign of Terror and when Napoleon made peace with the church, the bishop asked this man, Father Dujarier, to create or found a group of brothers, religious brothers, or brothers would say, Saint, brothers of St. Joseph they were called, to help serve in these parishes that were decimated by the reign of terror, okay? Because we had, you know, so many priests and religious were lost their lives or imprisoned or exiled. So he creates this group of religious brothers called the Brothers of St. Joseph. Okay, next slide, please. This is his town. His town is called Rouillet sur Loire. Okay, next slide, please. And this is a window in that church of that town depicting these brothers of St. Joseph. They were started like in I think about 18, uh, 1815 or so. Okay, this is important because and if we go to the next slide, please. So Father Moreau, eventually Father Dujarier, I should say, he gets to be too old, too frail to continue to oversee his brothers of St. Joseph. The bishop suggests, perhaps Father Moreau, you could do that. Assume responsibility for this little group of brothers, the brothers of St. Joseph. Father Moreau agrees, and he brings the brothers of St. Joseph to Le Mans from their town of Rouillet sur Loire. He brings them to Le Mans and joins them with his auxiliary priests that he had established at the seminary, okay? And if we go to the next slide, and he establishes them here, okay? At this place called Institution de Notre Dame de Sainte Croix, this is like the institution of Our Lady of Holy Cross. Now, when Father Moreau brought the brothers of St. Joseph from Rouillet sur Loire, and when he brought the auxiliary priests from the seminary to this site right outside of Le Mans, okay, it didn't look like this. This is what they built over the course of a couple of decades, okay? But it was the first educational apostolate of our religious community. And this educational apostolate set the standard for all of our educational apostolates going forward. Because in this place where the brothers and the priests and also sisters eventually worked together, children and young people were educated in the faith, but they were also getting the best education that would help them be successful in society, all right? Father Moreau would say things like, we shall not educate the mind at the expense of the heart. He wanted the formation of the whole person. He wanted the children to grow in virtue. He wanted them to be good citizens on earth so that they could then also be good citizens in heaven. He didn't want them to be deprived though, like he didn't want them just to get education of faith and that's all. He wanted them to get skills so that they could succeed in the world and contribute. So arts, sciences, um, so a varied subjects that we would expect to be in a school, all right? Um, that was kind of new. I, I know it sounds odd for us in a way, um, but that was sort of um, uh, very advanced for I think uh, a Catholic education to have like the best of literature, arts, and sciences. And also the model that he established here was a very family-based model. It wasn't like a, a military model. I think uh, Catholic schools in the past would have been, had a very great separation between the pupil and the teacher. 
which was more based on a military model, whereas Father Moreau's model of his school was more of a, a family-based, so that the priests and the brothers and the sisters would take like a, a real interest in the life of the student and know what's going on in their, in their home life. Again, that for us, it's just you're looking at the basis of like what our educational institutions are about today as Holy Cross, okay? Um, all right, so next slide, please. This is the first Marianite of Holy Cross. So I mentioned eventually he brought women in to make, to have sisters. So she was the first one of the women in Father Moreau's community. This is Mother Mary of Seven Dolors, or Seven Sorrows, okay? All right, next slide, please. So at saint croix les le mont which is the, t the commune, it was, I don't know how you would translate commune, right? It's like village, I guess. Um, it's a French term that de designates a kind of village, uh, um, but it's like a township or a village outside the city of Le Mans. So this means at Holy Cross near Le Mans, Father Moreau brings the auxiliary priests, the brothers of St. Joseph, the Maronite sisters, and he forms this association of Holy Cross, okay? That was a lot of information. This is just the historical stuff. And, uh, and he calls it Holy Cross because the village, the commune is called Holy Cross. So that's why we are the congregation of Holy Cross and not of the Holy Cross. We're named for this place, okay? Um, so now it was fortuitous or providential because Father Moreau had a strong devotion to the cross of Christ. How awesome that he says, wow, I've been given land in Saint Croix, Holy Cross. You know, it's like, I'm going to establish this educational apostolate there. This is great. Okay, next slide, please. And he develops this as the sort of emblem of this new religious association of priests, brothers, and sisters. What you have here is like um, the far left heart. See that anchor? Okay. And then the three hearts. The far left heart is the immaculate heart of Mary. That was the sisters had their patroness, they were consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The middle heart is the pure heart of, excuse me, the middle heart is the Sacred Heart of Jesus. The priests are consecrated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And the heart on the right is with the lilies. That is the pure heart of Saint of Joseph. And the brothers then have Saint Joseph as their special patron, okay? And an anchor is a symbol of hope, an ancient Christian symbol of, of hope. So, and then he has JMJ, see in the, in the anchor, on the stem of the anchor, stands for Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, all right? So this was our early emblem of Our Lady of Holy Cross. Interestingly, we had to change it. You might think, well, I thought you guys were the cross and anchors. Well, we're the cross and anchors because Father Moreau was forced to change the emblem because uh, Rome suppressed devotion to the pure heart of St. Joseph. I don't know why. So he was forced to change it. Okay, next slide, please. This is a clearer, a clearer image of the one that I just described. Okay, next slide. All right, so back to the window again. See that church, though? You're, the church in the top half of the window that you have? That's the church that they built, the chapel they built onto the school building. Next slide. That's it today. Um, and that's what we call the Shrine of Blessed Basil Moreau, which is now, you know, the, the, the village commune. It's no longer called Holy Cross because Le Mans has grown, and so the jurisdiction doesn't exist anymore. So now it's in Le Mans, and Father Moreau's tomb is there, and that's where we made a shrine in his honor. If we go to the next slide, and so see the church there, the chapel, attached to the whole school, okay? So uh, that's that church we call our conventual church. But I just explained that too, since it's in your window. Kind of create, making this talk around what's depicted in your window, okay? Uh, next slide, please. This is the interior of that church. It's really a beautiful church. Um, now, it went through a lot of history. I'm not going to talk about the history of the church because it's very long, but it, I think one of the most 
impactful moments of its history was that it was uh, the victim of a bombardment during the Second World War. And so uh, its windows were kind of blown out or, or damaged. So these are all post-war windows. Next slide, please. That's the interior of it. With a beautiful organ that was put in the 1940s as uh, a post-war organ. Next slide, please. This is the crypt of the church. Father Murrow spent a lot of time in this crypt. Uh, Father Murrow lived until 1873. This church was consecrated in 1857. So he knew this church, prayed a lot in this church. Uh, so it's right that his tomb be in this church today. Next slide. Okay, so really quick to also talk about what is Father Murrow's spirituality all about? Because it's, it's what he gave us as our spirituality, as Holy Cross. Conformity to Christ is big. It's about not just imitating Christ, but conforming yourself to Christ. Um, I think it's Gregory of Nyssa who said, a Christian should be like another Christ. And Father Moreau believed in that strongly. So he was all about being conformed to Christ. If you go back to the previous, please. Um, hope in the cross. Um, this was also a um, major part of his spirituality. It's something that he entrusted to us as our spirituality. Also, trust in divine providence, unity and community and zeal for mission. And I'll talk about those in a second too. Okay, now let's go to this slide. And now some of these, there's a lot of words here. Uh, but I'm going to quickly read through them. I think they outline briefly and generally each of these emphases of his spirituality. So heeding the wisdom of St. Gregory of Nyssa, who said a Christian ought to be another Jesus Christ. Blessed Basil Moreau desired to be conformed to Christ in all things. He sought to reproduce in himself Christ's attitudes and virtues, annihilating all traces of self-interest so that he might be God's true and faithful servant. Conforming oneself to Christ means seeking to imitate Christ in all things by avoiding sin, living virtuously, loving generously, and following the will of God instead of one's own. To conform oneself to Christ is to discover true and lasting joy. That's super important for us because Father Moreau eventually has his association become a religious order by having them profess vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And those vows are intended to conform us to Christ who was himself poor, chaste, and obedient, okay? And The Imitation of Christ, you may have heard that, of that little book. Um, of Father Moreau loved that book, and uh, it was a really important part of his own spirituality too. Um, I think it's Thomas Akempis wrote, the Imitation of Christ. I think it's the most popular book in Christianity after the Bible. So, all right, next slide, please. Hope in the cross of Christ. Father Moreau believed that the crosses we experience in life have the power to produce fruit, just as the cross of Christ produced the greatest fruit of all, our redemption. To hope in the cross of Christ is to believe that the sufferings we endure have the power to bear fruit in our own lives and in the life of the world. It is to be courageous in the midst of trial it is to trust that the darkness of night will be followed by resurrection's dawn. It is to discover purpose in the truth that bearing one's cross as Christ bore his has the power to conform us to him and to his way. So Father Moreau, over and over in his life, discovered that when he, for the work of God, you will encounter the cross, but that cross will eventually bear fruit. And that was certainly the case for the missions and I'll mention, talk about those in just a second. Uh, missionaries he sent around the world to different places, they certainly encountered the cross, but great fruit was born. The, the Christian lesson for, the, for us in this as disciples is the crosses we encounter, if we join them to the cross of Christ, the power of God made manifest in the, in cro in the cross of Christ can also be made manifest in the crosses that we carry as well. It's a message of great hope for, I think, for a world that's really burdened by a lot of crosses. Okay, next slide, please. And then trust in divine providence. As one of the most frequently re recurring themes in his writings, Father Moreau saw all as guided by the hand of providence. He trusted that our lives and our destinies rest securely in God's keeping. 
To trust in divine providence is to face present and future challenges with the assurance that God is in control. Such confidence in God's presence and love brings comfort and peace. And yet, trust in divine providence requires something of us as well. It requires that we cooperate with the benevolent hand that orders all things for the good and that we avoid those things that stand in the way of its progress. To go through life believing that our lives and our destinies are in God's keeping, um, that's like of great comfort. And um, like to believe that God is in control, right? This is something that Father Moreau emphasized and that we in our own community talk a lot about, is just trusting in the providence of God for our futures. Even when you see a lot of darkness in the world, right? We trust in the providence of God, okay? Um, let's do the next slide. Um, I'm gonna, not going to read this one, but Father Moreau also emphasized he wanted his religious to, be, to live united, okay? The priests, brothers, and sisters to be united as the holy family of Nazareth. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph lived united. And by this, he felt we would really be able to transform uh, and, and be effective in our ministries by our unity. And this is something we live as Holy Cross religious today. We do our ministry together, okay? We see our unity um, lived out in our apostolates as a um, reflection of Father Moreau's own kind of commitment to and desire that we be living united and communing with one another. And I think that's a really good example, too, to, in the apostolates that we serve for people to see how we live as united uh, in our family, of a religious family, and we're serving families and like a parish family like this to be united and not like divided into, you know, different interests and everything, right? But trying to live united. Okay, next slide. <coughs> and then this, uh, Father Moro was definitely very zealous for the mission. And uh, we too are called to, as religious of Holy Cross, we want to express, uh, be zealous in our own, in our work. Um, and our work is to make God known, loved, and served and to bring knowledge of salvation to others, right? So, um, zeal for mission. Okay, next slide. So, it wasn't good enough for Father Moreau to like just think of, well, we're gonna just serve these apostolates in France, right? Again, mostly educational apostolates, because he saw that education is a work of resurrection, right? Forming these young people, their hearts and their minds, educating them in the faith, but also in what they need to succeed in society. He sends Holy Cross missionaries, priests, brothers, and sisters, first to Algeria, then to the States, Canada, Italy, East Bengal, and Poland. So you've got here Holy Cross priests because Father Moreau made the decision to send missionaries to Indiana in 1841. Uh, you have here a priest from India because, because of the decision first to send to East Bengal, but then later it was Americans, right, who went to, it was Canadian, Canadians who went to India. Okay, so next slide, please. All right, so Father Moreau is now, like, got these missionaries around the world. The cross is very heavy, I mean, the things that missionaries are experiencing, especially in East Bengal, um, disease, um, boating accidents, um, just poverty, okay? Um, even the missionaries to Indiana, it was lack of funds, some religious persecution, um, disease, the cholera epidemic, uh, fire, um, tearing through the the campus that they built like two decades after arriving, okay? But that's the cross that eventually bears fruit. Now we look at our ministries in Bangladesh. It's amazing how they're thriving and how many religious we have in Bangladesh, including like bishops, I think, cardinals even in Bangladesh. Um, in the United States, we look at an apostolate like Notre Dame and all of our different apostolates around the country 
A lot of crosses, but the fruit has been great. Okay, next slide, please. So, these are some titles that we associate with Basil Moreau. Um, he was an apostolic missionary because he desired to like send his religious out to the world, right? Beyond the confines of Le Mans, beyond, beyond the territory of France even. Um, he believed firmly in divine providence. He wanted to be an educator in the faith. He saw education as that work of resurrection. There are beautiful stories of how he treated the poor. He started at his school in Le Mans, the first society of St. Vincent de Paul in a school. Um, it teamed up with the Society of St. Vincent de Paul in the city of Le Mans to deliver food to people in their homes. Never had there been a Society of St. Vincent de Paul in a school. He desired that for the students of his school to be able to experience that. Um, imitator of Christ, a loyal son of the church, Father Moreau was what we call an ultra Montanist. That is to say, his approach to teaching theology, scripture, dogma, was to look to Rome over the mountains, beyond the mountains, and not just have the French perspective, okay? So he was very faithful to the church in Rome. A man of the cross, he carried, bore the cross a lot in his life. Um, he, uh, he suffered at the end of his life greatly. He saw the closing of the school in Le Mans. That for him was a great burden. Um, he was basically abandoned by his community in his, um, like the last couple years of his life. Um, he died surrounded by the, the sisters of Holy Cross, the Marionettes of Holy Cross. In Father Moreau's death, I think we see his greatest conformity to Christ, mysteriously, providentially. Abandoned by the men, surrounded by the women, right? You think of Jesus on the cross here, right? Um, deprived of his possessions. He had lost all his possessions and saw and thought he saw his work as being a failure. I mean, that's like amazing conformity to Christ in his dying and his death in 1873. He was a man of deep prayer. Um, he composed not only our constitutions and statutes, but also meditations for us, a man of virtue and a priest. Above all, his like identity of priest is was central to who he, who he was. Okay, so next slide. Um, this is his tomb where pilgrims come to, to pray. See, all of this whole talk, based on your window, right, is was, was with the sort of like uh, secret intention, that I'm not gonna make, no, not so secret now, that you organize a pilgrimage one day to Le Mans for the parish. And you ask me to go with, Okay, so, and we can pray at Father Moreau's tomb and ask for his intercession and uh, because we believe, you know, he's now beatified in 2007, he was beatified, and we're praying for his canonization. We hope it won't be too long in coming. Next slide, please. This was his beatification, some photos of his beatification in 2007. It was a great event for in the city of Le Mans. That's the Cathedral of Le Mans. Um, the Cathedral of Le Mans is an amazing building built between the 11th and 15th centuries. Just outstanding combination of both Romanesque and Gothic architecture. So when we go there on pilgrimage, we'll go, I'll show you all that. It's, but it's outstanding cathedral. And it's huge. It's funny because when pilgrims arrive and they'll see that, they used to say, Father John, is that your church? You know, because I was the pastor and rector at this, the Holy Cross Church. And I'd be like, no, I mean, ours is a lot smaller. That's like, you know, the cathedral. Okay, next slide, please. Um, oh, now, just all I'm saying about these next couple of slides is to say, Father Moreau, I mean, his influence, right? His spirituality and charism influenced so much. Brother Andre, he becomes a Holy Cross brother in Canada, and his patron is St. Joseph. Why? Because Father Moreau had the patron of the brothers as St. Joseph, okay? So his devotion to his patron, St. Joseph, leads to the construction of this greatest 
shrine in the world dedicated to St. Joseph on Mount Royal in Montreal, Canada, right? So this is Brother Andre. He's also in your window. Okay, next slide. Perhaps you've heard of him, Venerable Patrick Payton, who says the family that prays together stays together. Well, I mean, that's just an outgrowth of our Holy Cross spirituality and Father Moreau's, like that spirituality that he handed on to us, talking about be like a family united together. We pray together in family. I mean, and Patrick Payton as a Holy Cross priest is formed in that, right? And then see how it bears fruit in the whole like family that prays together, stays together mission, right? You knew he was a Holy Cross priest, right? So he's now, uh, my generation doesn't really know much about him, but I think like grandparents would know big time him. He was an amazing missionary for the rosary, right? Champion of the rosary. Okay, next slide, please. All right, the last slides, because I want to leave a little time for any, any questions you might have. Um, these slides are just ones I thought you'd find curious, because this is the city of Le Mans today, right? Now, Le Mans has, you know, just to like get ready for our pilgrimage, Le Mans has a great Romanesque wall. Much of it is still intact. A, a Roman wall, I should, excuse, me, excuse me, not Romanesque, a Roman wall. The Romans built uh, occupied this region of France. And this portions of this wall were built like between the first and third centuries, right? So it's amazing to see this wall um, that used to encircle the entire old city. Next slide, please. Here's a little, some of the old city that still exists to this day. Did we go there? Did you go there when you guys were? Oh man, you missed it. Great old city. It's like a little medieval village. Okay, next screen, please. So this is the Le Mans of today. Um, this is the Le Mans that Father Moreau would have known, right? In, when he was in Le Mans in the mid, early to mid 19th uh, and late 19th century, right? So this was the Le Mans that was there. Okay, next slide. So, okay, next slide. Now, I thought this would be a good place to conclude because this statue is in the church of Holy Cross, Our Lady of Holy Cross in Le Mans. Anyone know what this statue is called? Can you see what it depicts? Who says it's a Pieta? <clears throat> it's not a Pieta. Well, most people would think it's a Pieta. That's why I'm kind of playing this little game. Because it has other figures present, right? So a pieta is when it's Our Lady holding the lifeless body of Jesus, taken down from the cross, right? The most famous pieta is Michelangelo's pieta, right? This is called a lamentation because it includes John, the beloved disciple, and Mary Magdalene. And this was a statue that was very important to Father Moreau because this was the focus of his devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows. And he gave her as the patroness of our congregation. Why? Because Our Lady remained faithful at the foot of the cross and held the lifeless body of her son, but not losing hope in the promise of God, right? She kept hope and then she was witness to the resurrection. So Our Lady, um, this statue then is sort of like the, lo the focus of that devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows, okay? So we as Holy Cross religious should be comfortable being with people who are carrying the cross of sorrow because we can talk about the power of God manifest in the cross and fruits that are born of the cross and the hope of new life, the hope of the resurrection, okay? Um, that's like the heart of our spirituality as priests and brothers of Holy Cross. Okay, next slide. This is the only photo we have of Father Moreau. So this photo was taken, I think probably sometime maybe in the 1860s. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't, you know, people say he looks kind of so stern. Well, Life was hard in the 19th century. What can you do? What can you say? The other, the other thing is, for a photograph in the 19th century, you had to remain still a long time. It wasn't instantaneous. 
So he had to just keep a pose. And third, I'm sure he was such a humble man. I'm sure he thought, why do I want to have an image of myself? He probably saw that as something that was really counter to everything he believed. But his religious convinced him, we need a photo of you, Father Founder. So he gave in, and this is a photograph of him, a very antiquated, you know, it's a very old photograph. Okay. And then next slide, I think that might be the last one. It is. Oh, we're going to now pray this prayer. But how about before the prayer? So any, any questions you'd like to ask about any of this? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so great question um, about you said that the priests and brothers abandoned him shortly before he died, and then how did they come back, right? The, the, to, the sort of, to, to state it succinctly, um, when Father Moreau was no longer head of the congregation as superior general, like we had elections and he became too old to stand in that, to have that office, his successor, one of his successors down the line, with the congregation's chapter meeting, decided we would withdraw from Le Mans, from that work of that first school. And for him, that was a great heartbreak. Uh, and he had to move out because the property was then sold to the, to the Jesuits. And it would continue as a Jesuit school and not a Holy Cross school. So he moved in with his blood sisters because, uh, who lived like around the corner, because we were not, the Holy Cross priests and brothers were other places. We were in America, we were in, um, in East Bengal, we were in Canada, you know, we were, it just, so, and then other parts of France. So Paris became more important for us. So Le Mans wasn't as important. And he disagreed and had to move out of the school and didn't want to go to Paris or anywhere else. He was elderly. All he knew was Le Mans. He wanted to stay there, moved in with his sisters. The Marianites, they maintained a residence right next door to his sister's house, and they remained very close to him. But the priests and brothers were elsewhere. When he, when he died, and, and word, word was able to get to Paris soon enough, that a couple of those men came back for his funeral. But um, yeah, he really kind of felt abandoned by his priests and his brothers of Holy Cross. And there was sort of like for decades, we didn't really talk much about the founder and we've only been rediscovering the richness of his writings and of the heritage we have from our founder within the last 40 years. So um, yeah, no, thanks for asking that. Yeah. Yes, so Father Edward Soren was elected um, Superior General in, um, I think it was the General Chapter, I think it was 1868. So Father, Father Moreau dies in 1873. So it was the Chapter of 1868, which was held in Rome, Father Soren was elected. Father Soren was president of Notre Dame. Father Soren believes the future of Holy Cross is in America, not in France. Father Soren had good reason to believe that. The war with Prussia came just a couple years later. I mean, the school was occupied by Prussians. World War II, the school was occupied by Germans. I mean, he just saw, I think Soren had that sort of wisdom to see, like, the success of the future of the congregation is going to depend on America. And I think it, I think it was. Yes, so then Father Soren and Father Moreau were kind of, were at, were kind of at odds. Father Moreau chose Soren for the mission in America. Father Moreau saw that Soren had the tenacity, the skill, uh, the devotion to make the mission in America succeed. He gave Soren to America. He could have kept Soren in France. Soren could have done great things for France. That said, 
America offered possibilities that France just didn't offer. And uh, Soren just rode that wave of American, like the immigration waves and everything in the mid to late 19th century and was very successful. Um, Soren also developed a real American perspective that Moro did not have. Um, Soren, you know, believed in the use of credit. You know, Moro was like, didn't really comprehend that. And uh, so, you know, it, they, they just had a lot of disagreements. Also, it's hard to communicate, right? It takes, I don't know, what, a month for word to reach uh, the other side, right? Um, so, anyway, yeah. Even the voyages were so difficult, it's amazing. Uh, the, the number of ocean crossings that Soren made, I mean, first to get from Notre Dame to the East Coast, then to get on a ship to France to go back to report in and everything. And while he's founding Notre Dame, it was unbelievable. So I don't know how he did that kind of travel. Yeah, any other questions? Yes. Right, so it was a question about the sort of process toward canonization. Um, so as part of the process, um, a Vatican committee will study all of his writings. Those were all submitted in the 1950s. His body has to be exhumed. The remains have to be examined to, to um, verify that indeed we're talking about a person who lived at this time. And, where he's buried and everything. Um, and then there's the miracle, right? So um, he was able to be beatified because um, the Vatican accepted the, um, the uh, judgment that a healing that occurred of a young mother in Canada was miraculous. And that was, I think, like in the 1950s, does this sound familiar to either of you? Father John Patrick, maybe I don't know, but I think it was it was early in the earlier in the mid 20th century, and so he was uh, beatified by John Paul II. Well, excuse me, it was John Paul II who gave the go ahead for the beatification. The beatification happened in Le Mans. It was kind of unusual at that time. Usually a beatification would happen in Rome also, but it was given permission to happen in Le Mans. On the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows, September 15th, Feast of, the, of Our Patroness. So, all right. No other question that you, you got it all. Now you can give this talk to you, any, anyone in your parish too. We're going to pray this prayer. Yes. So why don't we stand? I invite you to stand. And in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Together, Father Moreau, your burning zeal for the glory of God and the salvation of souls inspired you to undertake great works, even at the cost of personal suffering and sacrifice. Your missionary spirit moved you to respond to the needs of the church in difficult times by rekindling the Christian life in parishes, instructing youth, and forming brothers, priests, and sisters for the apostolate. Heeding the call of providence, you directed the eyes and steps of missionaries toward distant shores where you never ceased to guide, sustain, and bless them. Please pray for me that I, too, might be zealous for the kingdom of God, generous in heeding his call wherever it may lead, and faithful to the evangelical mission I received at my baptism. Amen. Amen. Blessed Basil Moreau.
pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. January 20th. So he died January 20th, 1873. So his feast day is January 20th, yes.